So the iris and the pupil. We drew the iris on earlier in the video, and by now I feel comfortable digging these out. We won't get too far when it comes to more detail than that with them in this video, but we'll set a stage for the next video in this series where we'll dive deep into some stuff we can do with the iris and the pupil. I'm going to use a loop tool to dig out the clay inside the iris, essentially inside the drawing that we established for the, for the iris and the pupil. This will leave us with a big hole in the eye that will somewhat mimic the change in value you see when you look at the eye of a person. You have the white of the eye and then the iris tends to be darker than that. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and if you want to see the full video, you can join my Patreon page. The depth to which we will dig will impact the value that we get and therefore change what color the sculpture's eye appears to have. There are plenty of tricks here and we'll get into them more in the next video. You can leave the iris simply dug out like this and I've done that plenty of times in my sculptures before. Frankly, it's a look I sort of like for the scales that I tend to work at. However, it really doesn't work so well when the scale is as big as it is here. Partially because I wanted to do some stuff to the inside of the eye for fun. And partially when I dug out the iris, I realized it looked sort of terrible. <laughs> so because of these reasons, we'll get more into doing the sign for the iris and the pupil in the next video. This kind of work tends to leave us with the need for some cleanup around the edges. The eye itself gets damaged and we need to rework the outline of the iris itself and reshape its roundness, if you will. It was at this time, when both of the edges of the iris are visible without the apex of the sphere in between them, that I realized that I hadn't been able to achieve the same depth at both the edges of the iris. The inside edge sat deeper than the outside edge. And this leads to an awkward situation where the eye is positioned straight ahead, yet appears to be looking to the right for us. I didn't capture this awkward look very well, since the camera is off to the sides a bit. And instead of pausing to capture it, I felt sort of disgusted with myself for allowing this to happen and tried to fix it as fast as I possibly could. This also means that once this edge has been brought forward, the eyeball itself behind the edge has to be re-sculpted a touch, which is not too big of a deal and not hard to achieve really. Yet a fault we can't allow to sneak into our finished work. Try to leave the edges of the iris fairly sharp for now. We can make these edges more fussy and softer later, but for now clarity is what we need and the best way to achieve that when it comes to the iris is to keep the outline nice and crisp. This allows us to judge it properly without having distractions get in the way. Distractions that once remedied later in the process only uncovers faults which we can and should deal with now instead of later. Context reveals more things to us and it's important that we don't let anything distract us. Some people like to argue for creating an impression of your subject and this can be very valuable advice. The impression of something does leave us with less work to do usually, which can be very nice. But personally, I'm a sculptor who prefers to not rely on too many impression-based solutions and I like things to be what they are meant to be in real life, if you will. And this line of thinking gets me into trouble sometimes, but for a study such as this, I think that's the appropriate approach. Make sure that the eyeball itself is a plausible sphere. It needs to turn back from the apex to the corners at a pace that allows it to believably fit within the eye socket. The same thing goes for how the eyeball interacts with the upper and lower lid. If where the sphere disappears behind the lids is too vertical from the side view, it will seem like the sphere should continue outside the lids and the eyeball starts looking like an olive, a squeezed ball instead of a sphere or perhaps a sphere that's simply too large for the eye socket and lids that you've built. If you've gotten this far into the video and you're still not subscribed, what are you doing? Hit that subscribe button and the bell to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. I do appreciate the support.
I personally find that shapes on the human body and the portrait as well are quite organic in nature, making them difficult to capture. Drawing with straight lines will really help you discover the secrets that make up complex curves. Let's take the lids as an example. The upper lid can on most of us be broken down into three straight lines. The composition of these lines depend on the individual and the direction which they are looking. Instead of looking for this incredibly complex curve, which the upper eyelid is, which we're unlikely to get right anyway, I'm looking for straight lines and how to compose those straight lines in order to best capture the curve that I see. I'm looking for the angle of the straight lines, I'm looking for the length of the straight lines in relationship to each other. This strategy promotes specificity to the subject in a way that we can, that can really elevate your work. By default, the straight lines tend to become softer and more organic over time. Starting out a bit more mechanical doesn't mean the sculpture will stay like that, as you can see here, but starting out this way ensures we capture the model's nature and what they have to offer. The lower lid is the same, except here a decent strategy tends to be two lines. If we take away the tear duct, that is. Everything can be dealt with through this simple strategy. Look at the lower edge of the eye socket, for example, four straight lines to make up this section. Take careful note when observing your model using this approach that the straight lines have variety to them. Start by thinking of which line is the longest and which one is the shortest, and then which one falls in the middle. This will already, without even having the lines at the correct length in relationship to each other, get you so close that your sculpture will begin to appear like the model, allowing us to engage our naive sense of observation. In terms of ways to observe, we have academic observation and we have naive observation. Academic observation refers to measurements. So for us that means comparative measurements, since we haven't and won't be using any calipers. This form of measurement is by default not that accurate, even if we did use calipers, and it's fraught with dangers if we get too attached to what we find. So use academic measurements be it comparative, side size, or calipers, to get your work close to the subject, but do not trust them to get you where you want to go. Naive observation refers to simply using our eyes, looking back and forth between the sculpture and the model, and recognizing the difference between the two. This mode of observation can only easily be engaged if our work closely resembles the model. Use academic measurements to make sure you get yourself close enough in terms of visual resemblance to engage your naive sense of observation while retaining enough flexibility in your work to allow changes to take place. Remember that the process in which you sculpt is meant to be flexible, not you as the sculptor. So the work should promote flexibility as a trait. You being willing to simply start over again at a moment's notice is not really what I mean when I say we should stay flexible. If your clay surface is in the sufficient state, usually one where the surface is really firm like leather and the rake marks from the previous passes are shallow and not too deep, then a loop tool will work really well in cleaning up the surface of your sculpture. Of course, there is no necessity of doing this other than that you want this to be the look of your final work. I'm using a light hand and letting my loop tool, which is just a smooth wire in a loop stuck in a wooden shaft, dance over the surface of my sculpture lightly. I go with shorter motions to avoid these long streaks on the surface and I also vary the direction greatly, but mostly going across the form. The key words here are lightly. I'm not interested in taking away a lot of clay when doing this. As I've mentioned many times in this video, flat sculpture is bad sculpture, so I'm trying my very best to avoid this issue. I only want to smooth out the surface a bit. If you're interested in learning more about sculpture, hop over to my Patreon page and I'm sure you will find something of interest to you there.
I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, remember to hit the like button. And I also hope you learned something that you can take with you into your own practice. Until next time, stay creative.